It's a privilege for me today to be able to introduce our speaker. I really don't think he needs an introduction, but um, we're happy that Pastor Bill Tucker, his wife Jackie, can be with us. I had the privilege of going to school with them back in the 80s. Uh, let's see, 80s. Well, I, I'm not too good with numbers. But it was a few years ago. The 60s. the 60s. Yeah, I know. You don't have to remind me. And then uh, several years ago, I had the privilege of being on a cruise with them and enjoyed fellowship together. Pastor Bill is the Speaker Emeritus for Quiet Hour, and we're just so privileged to have him today to share with you. Pastor Bill, share with the message God has for us today. Thank you, Larry. What a day to be back home, as it were. My home has been in many places, but uh, Keene has a special place. And to think that this weekend we're honoring the 50-year class. Any of my classmates here this morning, raise your hand. I see a few hands. You know, when you get our age, you don't take life for granted. It's also hard to believe that uh, I've been married to a gal for almost 48 years now. In fact, after dating 13 girls in the first semester in 1965, settled in with one, and then in 1968, June 5, a date to remember for both of us, standing right there, taking our vows for life, committing to each other, a commitment that has lasted, a commitment that we can thank God as we have entwined our, ourselves together in love, in commitment. And I ask you this morning, how committed are you to the Lord Jesus Christ. How committed to you are, are you to your friends, your family? You know, it makes a difference when we are committed to the Lord Jesus Christ, doesn't it? It's a lifelong commitment, a commitment that's not going to end just here, a commitment that we can look forward to throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. The passage that was read earlier, I'd like to share it with you in the New Living Translation. It says, is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Any comfort from His love? Any fellowship together in the Spirit? Are your hearts tender and compassionate? Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and purpose. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look only for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. You must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. For the next few moments, I'd like to just unpack this passage. What does it mean, any encouragement to belonging to Christ? I believe that in every human heart, in our DNA, there is place there, a sense, a need, a belonging. I believe that God created us as social beings, not to be recluse in society, but to have that security of belonging. I know that as a pastor and pastoring several churches before I came to Quiet Our Ministries, I had several people say to me as I'd be studying with them and then inviting them to churches, they would say to me, 
I feel I belong here. And perhaps you've said those words yourself. The need to belong. It's been said that we need to belong before we believe. We want to be a part of the in-group. We want to have that sense of security, belonging. And then the Scripture says, any comfort from His love. How many of you today feel loved? I know that I feel loved. My wife has loved me for many, many years. Friends have said to me, they love me. My grandchildren, they say they love me. I love you, Papa. I love to hear those words. And any grandparent loves to hear those words as well. We all do. But the greatest comfort is that Jesus loves me even more. His love is an everlasting love, a love that never fails, a love that's bigger than the deepest ocean, a love that's bigger than the universe, a love that is so big and so vast that it caused the only Son, Jesus, to come down and die on that cruel cross for you and for me. This love embraces us no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, and that brings comfort to us, does it not? The Scripture then says, any fellowship in the Spirit. You know, fellowship is so important, and this weekend we want to do a lot of that, fellowshipping with old friends, friends that we haven't seen in many, many years, connecting with people and classmates. We love to get together in fellowship. It is part of our DNA. But to be in the Spirit is to sense an even greater fellowship, the very real presence of the Holy Spirit in our lives. It puts our fellowship into a dimension on a higher level. It's an awareness that we're never alone. But to have the ever-present Holy Spirit with us who is declared another comforter representing Jesus, practicing the presence of Jesus every single day, every moment of our lives because of His presence within us. I ask you today, are you in the Spirit? Do you sense His presence in your life? Do you commune with Him on a daily basis? Is He real to you? But you are not in the flesh, Paul says, but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. If we live in the Spirit, we walk in the Spirit, he says, ministering to the people all over the globe. I have truly sensed the Spirit of God working, not only in my life, but in the lives of people that we've ministered to. And then the Scripture says, are your hearts tender? and compassionate. You know, I believe that this characteristic gets right to the very heart and DNA of God and in ministering to people. Recently, Jackie and I were in the country of Malawi, and we were right there on the campus of Malamulu, the oldest hospital outside of uh, North America. And there we had brought a team to minister to the people, to do medical clinics, to preach the Word, and to make new friends, to share with people the good news. One of those who were working with us was a young gal by the name of Taitlin Blood, 17-year-old, vivacious, vibrant person who loved the Lord Jesus. And she fell in love with the children of this village. And she was especially drawn to a girl by the name of Jacqueline. Now, Jacqueline had one of these Unsulu wraps around her that was tattered and torn and smelly. She found out that she was an orphan. She was drawn to her. And they got acquainted. And she literally embraced her. And one day, 
Taitlin said to Jacqueline, I want to give you something. Taitlin had gone into town and actually had purchased a brand new Ensula wrap. And she says, I want to give this to you, Jacqueline. And Jacqueline began to cry. She didn't want to take it. And she says, I want to take your Ensula, Jacqueline. And so, Jacqueline took her Ensula and then Taitlin gave her her own, brand new. And she continued to cry and they embraced each other. Well, this was noted by the women of that village. And the next day they came around Taitlin and Taitlin wondered if they wanted Ensula's as well. They said, no, we saw in you the very presence of Jesus as you ministered to Jacqueline. It definitely made an impact. The compassion, the ministry that went on there, and many people's lives were changed as a result because of the tenderness and compassion that was experienced there. And you know, when we take mission teams around the globe with our ministry, it gives young people and old alike the opportunity to minister to people and to show the tenderness and compassion that Jesus had. The passage also says, agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, being like-minded with the same mind as another translation states. I ask you this morning, when you get together as a church group and are discussing a project, discussing maybe the color of a carpet, do you all come to the same opinion? I don't think so. In fact, there seems to be more disagreements in many churches over little things like the color of the carpet. What is God saying here when he says, be of the same mind, when there are differences of opinion? Look at the election process today. Is everybody of the same mind? Hardly. Lamb blasting each other. So what is God saying here? Well, I think God is greatly concerned in our desire to ascend rather than to descend. Why we're promoting ourselves to advance our own cause. We redefine, we redefine Jesus through the circumstances of our own lives, trying to make him fit into our way of thinking. We carve him and mold him after our own wills. But when we follow Jesus, from the manger to the cross, it's anything but a life of self-indulgence. Jesus says each step of the way, take up your cross and follow me. Each step leads us downward. And it's hard for us to even imagine that deity came down to planet earth as a servant, demonstrating that in the upper room in the position of a foot washer. How much more could one descend? Well, he can descend all the way to the cross. It's hard to fathom that God was on his knees washing his followers' feet and dying on a cross to wash us from all sin. God is saying, if you follow me, follow my example. Don't just do what I say, but do what I do every day of your life. That's having his mind. You know, we live in a world where losing is not an easy thing to take, whether it's politics or whether it's the Dallas Cowboy football team. Last year wasn't a good year, was it? Those of you who watch Dallas football games, and I do, I've been a Dallas fan for many years. I say losing is hard to take, but to have the same mind of Jesus, to be in complete 
agreement with his way of thinking, with his will for our lives and the lives of others. And he goes on in that passage, Paul does, describing the mantra of Christ and the mantra that you and I are to put on. He says, don't be selfish. One of the big reasons, I believe, for war among nations and communities and families is none other than selfishness. It's the greatest battle that you and I will ever fight on this earth. When we were getting ready to adopt our first child, Amy, who's over 40 years of age now, we came before a a county judge there in Albany, Georgia. He said, this is a very pleasant thing for me to do. Too often, I'm settling divorce cases. And I asked the judge, what is the biggest reason why there are so many divorces in this county? Because three out of five marriages in that county were in divorce. He simply said to me, it's selfishness. Selfishness. And you know, selfishness starts at an early age. Our youngest grandson, Jack, has learned to say, no, that's mine, to his sibling sister. Rivalry starts at an early age. It's the natural human response. It's only when you come connect with the Lord Jesus Christ that selfishness begins to settle to be selfless, thinking of others before yourself. It can only happen through a transforming relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a radical change from who we really are, normally speaking. One of the greatest examples that I read about in modern-day times is Mother Teresa working tirelessly in Calcutta, ministering to the poorest of the poor. And that book, Irresistible Revolution, is described Mother Teresa's feet, which look so deformed, like the feet of lepers that she worked with. She couldn't stop, you couldn't stop staring at them. One of the sisters remarked one day to visitors who were noticing Mother Teresa's feet, she explained that Mother Teresa wanted to wear the worst pair of shoes so that the orphans, the children that she was ministering to did not have to wear those. And because of wearing those kinds of shoes, the worst pair, her feet became deformed for the sake of those children. This, to me, represents the selfless, sacrificing love of Jesus. Be humble, thinking of others better than yourselves. Don't look out for your own interests, but take an interest in others too. One of the greatest attributes is servant leadership. Thinking of others before yourself, ministering to others before yourself. You know, I've worked in many different areas and trying to get people to come to my meetings, people who are being studied with. I'll not forget going out to where a hay farmer was needing to bale his hay. And I'd never done that before. But to show an interest in him and him knowing that I took that interest, I spent three hours one afternoon baling hay with this farmer in northwest Arkansas. You know, he was so impressed. He said, I'm going to come to those meetings. He became a close friend. He was baptized, went into ministry. Our song should be others. Lord, help me live from day to day in such a self-forgetful way that even when I kneel to pray, my prayer shall be for others. Others, Lord. Yes, others. Let this my motto be. Help me to live for others that I may live like thee. Help me in all the work that I do to ever be sincere and true and know that all I do for you must be done for others. 
Let self be crucified and slain and buried deep and all in vain. May efforts be to rise again unless to live for others. And when my work on earth is done and my new work in heaven's begun, may I forget the crown I've won while thinking of you and others. Finally, Paul says you must have the same attitude that Christ Jesus had. He looked at others in the best possible light. There wasn't a negative bone in his body. He looked at others not because of all their weaknesses, but he looked at others because of the transforming power that would take place in their lives. Thomas Jefferson said, Nothing can stop the man with the right mental attitude from achieving his goal. Nothing on earth can help the man with the wrong mental attitude. A positive attitude is a contagious one, a quality that draws people to those who look for life at life and experiences in the best possible life. I want to leave you with this thought. God is in the business of giving you more than you could ask or think. I asked God for water, and he gave me an ocean. I asked God for a flower, he gave me a garden. I asked God for a friend, he gave me all of you. If God brings you to it, he will bring you through it. In happy moments, praise God. In difficult moments, seek God. In quiet moments, worship God. In painful moments, trust God. And in every moment, thank God that it may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. One of these days soon, we're going to have sweet fellowship. Sweet fellowship, what a glad homecoming that's going to be, a glad reunion, reunion with those of our classmates who are now resting in the grave, those of our family members who are waiting for the life call of the life giver. Yes, one of these days, we're going to fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ, the Father, the Holy Spirit the holy angels throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity. That is the hope that you and I have, the hope that is burning brighter, I hope, today than yesterday.